Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today, either uh, your afternoon or your, your morning. Um, we're very excited to have you. I think a few people are still uh, registering or just signing in, and we have a number of people that have registered, but they're actually international, so they'll actually get the recording um, tomorrow. So welcome. My name is Leon Morales, and I welcome everyone to the Financial DNA Community Call. We try to do this call quarterly, and we've got a lot of great features to talk about today. So uh, I'll be co-hosting with Nikki Evans, our Chief Learning Officer here, and I'll let Nikki do a quick introduction, and then we'll just go over some quick uh, sort of uh, housekeeping items to uh, make sure that we keep the uh, webinar on track. Thanks, Leon. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Excited to have you here with us, and I am looking forward to sharing some new things that are coming out from DNA. Um, we're really excited. We've got lots of new announcements for you today. And um, so we're, we're looking forward to the presentation. Thanks for joining us. Excellent. And just for everybody's uh, purposes, there is a chat box if you want to chat with one of us. There's also a Q&A box there if you see that. And as we go through this, uh, Nikki and I tend to be pretty fast paced. But uh, if we gloss over something, please enter it into the Q&A box or the chat box, it can really benefit everyone. We try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, we do have a number of people that actually are, you know, because the company is global that aren't able to be here. So they do benefit from the Q&A. Um, so we have a pretty exciting agenda today and uh, we will cover the new investor experience. We've been promoting that for the last 60 days, but we're gonna walk through that just because we have questions that come in about that. So we'll cover it. Also introducing the coach network and how that works. And one of the things we always try to do is uh, work through a case study, because that's pretty important. Connecting the behavior to sort of actual client interactions is important. And then we have an upcoming remote training cohort. We just started our business DNA cohort this morning, and we have one for financial DNA starting August 19th. We'll give you more details on that. And then we have a referral code update coming. We've had a number of our clients that actually refer us to other clients. And we haven't always made it as easy to make it easy for you to promote that. So that's one of the things that we're featuring. And then we'll have time for Q&A. And just for everybody's benefit, you will get a copy of this presentation along with the recording. So if you want to later listen to it or pass it over to any of your team members, you can do that. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Over to you, Nikki. Great, thanks, Leon. So I think we wanna start with the poll question, so I'm gonna pop it back over to you to run that poll. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. All right, uh, so question, because we have been promoting the, uh, the new investor experience for about 60 days. Have you seen it or heard about it or used it? Um, have you seen it? Yes, not sure, or no, the options. And I will put that on the screen here. And if you'll just take a second to answer that, because we're always interested if our messages are getting out there. Okay, we got about 60% of the vote. Okay, almost 100%. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna end the poll here. And here's our results, Nikki. Um, yes, 10% have heard about it. Uh, 20% are not certain, about 70% no. So we'll probably have an opportunity here to really walk through that. Excellent, great. So you're in the right place. You're gonna to get to hear about and see the new investor experience now. So um, one of the things that we have done is changed the, the way the questionnaire works. So here you can um, drag your answer to most like and least like. So we found that this actually does speed up the um, the answers for people. Um, and then we also have a little nudge if you're, uh, that, that helps you understand so you can see how many questions you have left to go and, and kind of a completion bar percentage. And again, you can just do drag and drop for your answers. And if you're, we, we like to time the assessment right about 10 minutes is the average time it takes to complete. So if you're running behind that, we can show you that you're slightly slower than the average. Um, or we can show an indication that you're right on average or, or slightly above average with the um, speed that you're going through to try to encourage your clients not to overthink and to run through the questions. 
so that they get the most accurate response. So we're excited that this new uh, look and feel for the questionnaire is out. And then once you finish, you get a new screen for your clients where they're able to see their style, view their report, which they can click on and do a download of their report. They can watch a video about what that style is. Then they can see their financial behavior overview, which will give them these five dials. They can see a video on market mood and what their current market mood is. And then this page will scroll down and show um, some of their behavioral biases and some additional information about their particular profile. So we're really excited to introduce this. You should be able to get to this in your own admin system now, and you'll get this presentation later, but I have a link here to a support article that will take you to where to go in your system. As an administrator in your system, if you go to your group page and do your self-registration setup, you will now see a new link in the, in the self-registration setup. That new link is labeled um, investor. And if you click on that, you, you can click on that new self-registration link and it will take your clients to the page that allows them to register to go through this questionnaire and then get this result at the end. So um, Leon, I see a couple things popping up in chat. Do you wanna, do, can you take a look at those and see, is that something that we wanna address? Yep, I sure will, Mickey, thank you. So, um, Danny, let me Nikki, quickly answer your. You, yep, you got it. Okay. I, I see your question in chat. I haven't looked at the Q and A question, but I see Danny's question in chat for a link for the clients to view what to expect. There is when they go to that initial registration page um, on your group registration, they will actually see a video and um, some instructions that will walk them through what to expect and how to take the assessment. So it gives them a quick. You, they can either watch a video or read the instructions or both. And then it will take them to the page where they get the questionnaire. So it doesn't drop them at the questionnaire right away. It drops them to a page where there's a video and then some explanation. Um, so they do have access to that. Um, Great, and um, thanks Danny for that. And then the other one was not a question. Nikki, so you can proceed. Okay, okay. So again, um, you'll get the link. And if, if you go to dnabehavior.com slash support and do a search for investor experience, you can find that help article. And like I said, that link is actually here in the presentation. So when you get this presentation, you can just click on that link and it will walk you through the instructions of where to go in your admin system to find that link. You can then add that link to emails that you send out to clients, to your website, um, whatever you need to do to get um, your clients enrolled in this new experience. So you can still get to them through the, um, through the regular admin system. It's just a different link for the self-registration that you would send out to them. Right now, that's the only way that you're able to do the new investor experience. So we don't have an, um, a pre-register set up for that where with the current system, you can schedule clients to take the, um, to take the discovery with the new experience, you can send out the self-registration link. So you can still customize a letter that goes out to them to ask them to register. Or like I said, you could make that link be part of your email signature or part of your website or part of a welcome letter that goes out and you can see where to get to that link in the, um, in the help center. So, um, before we get to the to the next section, so that kind of gives you an overview of what that new investor experience is like. We're really excited about it. It launched broadly in um, late April. So we've had some people working with it. And like Leon said, we've been trying to get the message out that that's available now for all of our uh, subscription clients. And so um, we're looking forward to you being able to use it. And we think it'll be a better experience um, for your clients. So, um, we do have another poll, poll question, question for you here. Yeah. yeah. All right. And this question really relates if uh, any of you have gone through the financial DNA training, you know, Nikki really talks about this. And we, and Hugh Massey, our CEO, always recommends that after the client completes 
the questionnaire and they get their report, that you acknowledge that they completed that. It's important to do that. How deep you go with it is something that, you know, we can discuss on this call because Nikki's got some uh, features that we wanted to, um, or options that you can think about. But it is important. So one of the things we want to ask here is after, uh, after the client completes the questionnaire, and you notice here it says uh, asking the client if they think or feel about their report, do you find it helpful to ask this question with your client? And I'll get to why it's important to know if you think or feel about it. But here are the options. A, it helps me understand my client better. B, it helps develop a stronger relationship with the client. C, I don't ask my clients any questions about the report. And D, I don't ask my clients any questions but would like to learn more. Or E, none of the above apply to this situation. Well, that's an involved question, but we do have a, um, a reason for asking that. So it'll just show up here on the screen. Okay, here we go. So if you could just take a second, I know there are um, five options, but uh, it's important for us to understand because we do recommend that there's some understanding. So just uh, if you don't mind to answering that, we're about 70% of the voting. If we could just get a couple more, maybe close it out in three seconds. All right, here we go. Here we go, Nikki. Um, actually, so 73% said yes, it helps me understand my clients better. So that's wonderful. Um, B, it definitely helps in uh, uh, developing stronger relationships of another 36%. C, nobody uh, answered, I don't ask questions about the report, which I think is great. And then uh, D, um, learning more, they don't need that. And then E, none of the above apply to the situation. So I think that gives us a really good understanding. It's a high percentage of people that actually at least acknowledge that the uh, client has completed the, the questionnaire. And the reason we put in here, do you ask your clients how they think or feel about their report? If any of you have really studied the report, you know, those of us that are a little bit more results focused, we tend to be um, a little bit more rational around sort of thinking. So we don't necessarily feel something, we think it. So, and you can actually see in the report of somebody, we always say that uh, um, on the left side of the wheel, on the 10 unique profiles, those are the more results focused individuals. And we would ask that question, what did you think about the report? Because that'll be more natural for them. And the folks that are on the right hand side, which would be sort of influencer, engager, community builder, relationship builder, um, facilitator and adapter, we would ask them how they feel about the report. It really act as sort of a, a, a way to engage with the client. So that's why we asked that question. So really appreciate you answering the question. Great results. And I'll turn it back over to Nikki. Great. Thanks, and I do see a couple questions in the Q&A box. Nikki, I'll go ahead and answer those. Or if it's important, I'll bring it up. Okay. So one of the things that we um, we get questions about and one of the things that I typically walk um, new advisors through is kind of how to prepare for a client meeting using this financial behavior report. So we launched the financial behavior report last year and it's now our recommendation for the report that you give to your to your clients automatically when they complete report. It's one page. It's pretty easy for them to understand. It has a, a good bit of information on it, but it also then provides a good place for you to start as a talking point with your clients. So the first place that I tend to look when I'm looking at this report is down where I have that number one marked in the lower left. And that's gonna give you what style is the client that you're looking at. And so here um, I see that Jennifer is a relationship builder. And if I look, she is below the line in the middle here, meaning she'll tend to move more carefully uh, so maybe we'll want a slower pace with me and, and want to uh, have some time to think things through versus clients on the top side here that are going to be faster paced. And then although difficult to see in this presentation, there is a gray line here in the middle. And so this is what Leon was referring to the more she's going to tend to be more relational. Uh, those on the on the other side of the wheel will tend to be uh, more results focused. So my style as an initiator, I will tend to be faster paced and more results focused. So that's going to require for me 
working with Jennifer to slow myself down a little bit to be a little bit more relational. So I would probably start with a, how did you feel about your results question with Jennifer? Um, have some discussion about what was it like for you to take it? How did you feel about it? What did you, what did you, how did you feel about the accuracy of the report? What questions do you have? Um, and then I tend to look here at these keys to adopting the plan. So this is going to be where I can know what kind of environment do I need to set up with this client, Jennifer, so that we can have a good conversation and that she can feel really comfortable. So here I'm gonna to wanna to create a relaxed environment. I may choose not to meet with her in a boardroom. I may choose to meet with her in more of a casual environment, a lobby kind of area, or where there's you know comfier chairs um, in an environment that feels fairly relaxed and safe. Um, I want to allow her to collaborate and provide input with me. So I'll ask for her ideas and feelings on things. And I'm gonna remember her need to avoid conflict. So not that I ever endeavor to have conflict with clients when I meet with them, but thinking through things that may be difficult or may seem confrontational, trying to, you know, if I have an opinion that I need to share or some difficult news that I need to share with her, trying to do that in a safe way, maybe not coming out and saying it directly, but trying to make sure that I've put some context around it so that she can understand it so that she can feel really comfortable. So I look at those areas around keys to adopting the plan. So right off the bat with just those two pieces of information, I know to slow myself down, to be more relational than is maybe um, natural for me, to make sure that I've created an environment that's relaxed, to provide um, a, a place for her to collaborate and provide input. So those are gonna be things that I would look for. And then in the, with these five dials, I'm gonna look at her scores here and, and kind of talk her through, how do you think this shows up? It looks like you're really, um, you're really good at managing um, safe, safety and staying away from risks. You're really good at seeing pitfalls in areas that may, may be risky and maybe coming up with contingency plans. What feels risky about working with an advisor to you? How much risk are you willing to take in your portfolio? So to me, this looks like a really low, low risk taker. Um, if she's got really big plans for her portfolio, that's an area that we're going to have to talk about. And again, I'm going to want to make it safe for her and not be confrontational and say, well, you're not willing to take enough risk to get the reward that you're looking for in your portfolio, but to really talk through what feels comfortable and, and is there a way that I can help her feel more comfortable pushing outside of her risk comfort zone a little bit in order to maybe achieve some of the goal that she's looking for in her um, management plan. So I can do that with each of these five dials, kind of look at what that score is, talk with her about how great she is at saving and following budgets and how that may help her and how that may reduce some risk in some other areas that she might have. It looks like she may be fairly comfortable delegating to an advisor, but wants a really good relationship. So again, what will make that um, be a good relationship. How often should we meet? Where should we meet? Should we have phone calls or in-person meetings? Probably better for her than a high-level email. Um, so again, just kind of looking at these dials gives you an idea of, of having some conversation, asking, you know, that um, wealth building motivation score is fairly low. So she's going to prefer flexible goals and, and some um, be more content. Um, rather than goal driven and driving to achieve big goals. So having that conversation, what do you want your um, wealth portfolio to look like? What does that mean to you? How important is that? If I were to say that we had to work a little bit harder for that, what, um, how can we meet your need for balance and, and steadiness in the current environment and also push toward those goals so that you can have that steady content environment in later life as well? So it, I see it as my job as your advisor to help push you a little bit outside of your comfort zone potentially in investing today so that you can have that kind of really comfortable environment that you're looking for in, uh, in the future uh, so, that we can, so that we can meet your goals. So those are some areas that, and then, um, so, so that's how I would use those dials, kind of talking through that, looking for areas and thinking about questions that I could ask that drive you know, does this feel right to you? Do you see this in other areas of your life as well? How should we work together? 
to ensure that you're going to meet what you want. So it gives me some good areas to ask questions here. And then in this section four, I look at around behavioral biases. So here I'm going to see where those decision making biases may happen. And some of those decision making biases may come out in this financial emotional intelligence as I look that she may make emotional decisions or spur of the moment decisions. Those decisions may start to look like some of these behavioral bias areas. And so I can talk to her about, hey, this is a pattern that you've developed. It's something that's really natural to you. Sometimes these patterns can be really productive for us to understand and to feel safe, but you may not realize um, that these biases also are impacting the way you're making decisions. And so let me help you understand what these biases are and how we might address some of them or what it might look like to uh, challenge some of these biases in some of your decision making. And as your advisor, my job is to help you see where you might have a bias in your decision making and help you maybe see if there's some other options and to make you feel comfortable moving along that route. So let me just stop there. Leon, are there questions that we want to answer on this? And we do have one question here. Um, and it's uh, a question on uh, the specific report. And it sounds like there's a disconnect in this example. You have a saver, say he follows budget, but is impulsive. You see that? So, <clears throat> sure. So what this really means is, so she's she's pretty organized around saving and following budgets. Where that impulsive comes in is around how are those decisions that she's making around finance going to be made. So while saving is, is one area, so planning for saving um, is something that she's fairly strong on, but then being in the moment and being um, swayed by making an emotional decision is something that she may also uh, be challenged with. So these five dials are made up of a blend of each of our scores. And so what you're seeing in planning management is more of a blend on our um, uh, planning. So that's planned versus spontaneous for those of you that are really familiar with all of the back end pieces. As you're looking at the emotional intelligence, you're also looking some at risk, you're looking some at how cooperative and patient are you versus and, and content versus how take charge and fast paced and pioneering are you. And so it looks to me like she would have more, especially being a relationship builder, right? Probably more cooperation and patience. So looking to please other people and in doing so may make emotional decisions or spur of the moment decisions to try to make conflict go away and to make sure that the people around her feel, feel um, safe and taken care of, you know, looking out for others. And so that may make her make emotional decisions around how she's spending or what she's doing to try to um, keep the peace in the moment um, to avoid conflict. And so with that, those emotional decisions may be more impulsive, trying to just make the conflict go away, trying to, um, make sure that other people feel um, part of the decision that she's, that it's a little bit of that patience and cooperative that you're seeing in that. Um, and so that's, that's the difference. So she may be very good at planning, um, but then also is really keen on maintaining relationship as a relationship builder and making sure that there's harmony in relationship. And so if it comes down to making a difficult decision, she may tend to be more impulsive around wanting that harmony versus making a difficult decision or looking to somebody else to make the decision. So if someone else makes a suggestion, she may jump on that as the decision rather than being really analytical thinking through that decision. So that's where I see those two things playing out. Does that make sense? And the other thing, Nikki, to add to that, you know, fortunately, because as a relationship builder, and if she has a trustful relationship with the financial advisor, because you see that score of 79, she's more likely to consult before she makes the decision. So she may be impulsive and she does want to please, but she's probably going to look for the direction of the expert that she considers. So I think that's uh, something that, you know, is important from a financial advisor perspective. Yep. All right. Very good. So that's how, that okay. 
So that's how um, I approach looking at this financial behavior report and it just gives you some key areas on the report to look for as you're thinking about and planning. I would also consider kind of where you fall on that report. And so that's the, the other report that you can run as a comparison report. So you can do a client advisor comparison or you could do um, a couple's comparison. If this was a if this was the client Jennifer and her advisor was Matt, a strategist, they're very different. And so Matt, the strategist, is going to have to um, really be conscious of how different he is from Jennifer and think about the flex that he's going to need to make. So as a strategist, he's going to tend to be very visionary, very pioneering, want to make decisions, pretty tolerant of risk. Um, and so, and, and much more results focused, bottom line focus. Uh, and so working with a relationship builder, like that strategist is going to fall into the fast paced uh, results category, like the initiator. And so he's going to have to really think about slowing himself down um, as an advisor to make that environment comfortable because it's not his natural place. Uh, to slow things down and be more relational as a strategist. So he's going to have to, to make some effort to be more relational. He's going to have to remember that she has very different viewpoint about risk than he does. So he's a big risk taker and very tolerant of losses. She is really not much of a risk taker, really wants to remain safe and, and have contingencies, very cautious. And so as he sees opportunity, He's going to maybe have to dial back his enthusiasm for risk to, to match her a little bit. Um, she will tend to want to delegate to him and that will suit him because he'll tend to want to maintain control and uh, of decisions. But I think watching out for, just like Leon said, she will tend to want to delegate and she, she will tend to potentially make impulsive emotional decisions to um, to follow the lead of someone that she sees as an expert. And so he's going to have to be very careful that the lead that he is um, bringing is a lead that serves her needs and not a lead that's comfortable for him because he's going to be much more aggressive in a portfolio plan, uh, much more comfortable with loss, much more aggressive in taking chances than she is going to be. And so he's going to have to remember to advise her where she is rather than based on what would be comfortable for him. So that's just an area where she will tend to probably defer to him, especially because he will come across as confident and he is an expert in this area and that's why she's there. Um, he will tend not to want to second guess himself. He will tend to be very um, balanced with his impulses, with, um, with logic. And so he's going to have to just remember that her tendency is going to be to defer to him no matter what. And so he, he really has to be careful to have her best interest and her plan at heart uh, as, he's, as he's working with her because he's going to tend to want to pursue more ambitious goals than she is. Um, and so th that's where I think that difference in risk and goal per pursuit is going to be a big difference between the two. And so for Matt, the advisor, he's going to really have to focus on how does he slow himself down? How does he get more relational? How does he make sure that he's serving her interests and what's comfortable for her in the situation, although it may seem um, much too tame of a plan for him personally, that's really what she's going to need to feel comfortable. And so this is one of the reasons why we like to run these comparison reports. It just helps you lay out how similar or how different is your client? I would say, you know, long term, Matt probably doesn't want a book of clients that look like Jennifer because that's going to be really exhausting to him to have to slow down and be more relational all the time is not his behavioral strength or his behavioral pattern. So while he will be able to do it, I would say in going into a meeting with Jennifer, if Matt is the advisor, he's going to have to really center himself and think about her needs and think about how he can flex to meet her in some of these areas as they, as they have their conversation. So um, I'll pause there for a minute to you. If anybody has any questions, um, you can drop them in the chat or the Q and A box. And I'll just add to that, Nikki, this is one of the great reports that shows not only the comparison to the advisor to the client, like you're demonstrating, but also to use with the client couple 
where um, this is actually more typical of what you see in a couple relationship where one is very different than the other, one more the relational one, more the, one more the, the results focused individual. And this is one of the reports that you can use to really understand quickly how you need to sort of manage the meeting. Now, there's some other reports like the, the financial DNA summary report, which is great because it gives you sort of a way to set the meeting up. But this is a, a really good one page view. It also has that same report that you showed earlier for each of the clients. So it's a great report to use, um, but it really shows because typically as the advisor, you're going to probably resonate with one of them more similarly than the other. So just keep that in mind. And you may also find that um, you get um, some clients really seeing um, a uh, an aha moment here. Oh, no wonder we're so good at saving, but our our plans often pull off track because I'm looking to you know make a big plan happen, and and you're looking to have that more steady, content life going on. So um, we do have a question. Nikki, sure. I think that's great to share with the audience. <clears throat> Do we recommend that the advisor share the comparison report with their clients? Absolutely. I think it's one of the best things you can do. That's why this financial behavior report is really easy to use because it doesn't have a lot of behavioral finance language in it. There's some other more advanced reports that you may not necessarily want to get in sort of in front of the clients just because it can get a little complicated, but for you can be great to see those. But this is one report that just creates a lot of discussion. So you could definitely share that. We also recommend that you share it with the client, your own report with the client, because a lot of times that can create a lot of trust building in the relationship with, with both the client couple or the individual client. So thanks for asking that. Yes, and I would also say um, that even prior to, you know, especially for those clients that may be a little bit more skeptical about taking something or maybe clients that you've already been working with that didn't go through this process at the beginning of your relationship that you would really like to see go through this process. If you share your report with them and say, this is what you're going to get. And these are the kinds of conversations that I think this will open up for us. That can be a really great way to, like Leon said, build trust and transparency with your client and invite them to see some information about you and see what they're going to get for themselves as part of the um, investment in taking the discovery. All right. So I got a little ahead of myself um, and I told you some of this, but if you want to put in the chat, where else do you think, and I'll flip back to the slide so you can see the two of them, where else do you think Matt would have to um, flex to be a good advisor? What are some things that you might do if you were Matt trying to work with Jennifer as an advisor that you might consider doing? And you can actually, if you do want to answer that, you can either put it in the chat box or the Q&A. And then Danny, I saw your question. I'm not going to go through the mechanics of doing the comparison report in the admin system right on this call, um, but it would be go to the facilitation tools tab, choose comparison report, and then you choose your two clients or your client and yourself as an advisor and then you would choose financial behavior comparison, and then that will generate the report. If you need more information about that, though, you can contact our support team and they can walk you through that. And Nikki, we do have a question. It's not necessarily related to this, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, explain how I view risk on that report. Um, say that again? Yep, so on that, how how does the advisor, if they're the advisor, how do they explain risk to the client? Sure. So um, here you're talking about what is your natural kind of hardwired attitude toward risk? 
So people that score high on this are going to be natural risk takers. They will be people who tend to leap before they look, maybe to take bold action. Um, they tend to be fairly tolerant with loss um, or fairly understanding that that's a possibility if they take a risk. Um, they tend to figure things out as they go. Um, where people that are uh, more on the cautious side tend to really think through things before they take, they tend to do their research, they tend to have contingency plans, they tend to think through what could go wrong and have some contingency around that. They tend to be happier after a decision is made when they know that they can either put their contingency plan into place or the, or the risk was realized or not realized. Um, so, it, you know, that it, it applies both to how do you look at spending money from a risk standpoint, but also other decisions that you make. I know Leon shares a story often about making a decision very quickly about going into accounting because someone said, hey, you have to make a choice about where your, you know, what career program you want to be in. And so he just picked one, went with his gut, which is a little spontaneous, but pretty high risk taking. And then, you know, at one point in his career, he just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of done doing this job. I don't want to, I'm not excited about this work anymore. I don't want to do this job anymore. Quit his job, didn't have an, another, you know, gave plenty of notice, but didn't really have anything else lined up. He just knew he would figure it out because he was just done. And so that's an example of how high risk shows up where there are some people that would never dream of quitting a job without another job lined up and maybe a backup for that. Those are your lower risk people. So I'd say Jennifer was probably somebody who I'd be very surprised if she just quit her job with no plan in place where Matt, I wouldn't be so surprised if he just said, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to go figure something else out. Um, it'll just work itself out. And so you can see that risk play out, not just around how you think about money, but how it plays out in your, in your life in general. So again, I think you know, in, in this risk taking, Matt would have to slow himself down or, or really consider being um, more cautious to match Jennifer's style a little bit. She's more relational, he's more results focused, so he's gonna have to flex to be more relational to meet her. Um, he's gonna be a more ambitious goal setter. Um, so the goals that he may even have for her may be more ambitious than goals that she has for herself. So he's gonna have to recognize that. And you know, he may wanna challenge her a little bit to try to push her a little bit outside her comfort zone as an advisor, but his comfort zone is way, way, way outside of her comfort zone. So he's gonna to have to dial back what he considers outside of a comfort zone, even to push her a little bit. Um, and then around their financial decision-making, we talked a lot about this, where she's gonna to tend to defer and, and wanna keep the peace and not be in conflict. He's gonna be very confident in his decision-making um, and so he's just going to have to watch out that she is making a decision that she feels good about and not one that she feels pressured to make to make him happy or to keep the, the conflict out of their relationship. He, she's going to he's going to want to help her really feel confident in the decision that she's making. And Nikki, there's one other question that came in and it's mm -hmm. um, the difference between risk behavior and financial, emotional intelligence, just because um, it looks like Matt would have a more difficult time getting to her to commit to a plan. It's in the chat box. Can yep. you speak to that? Yeah, so especially if it's Matt's plan, he may have trouble um, getting her to commit to a plan. And so helping, um, I think in this case, because relation, because she's so relational focused as a relationship builder, relationship is super important to her. So as an advisor, having her think about how does she, how will her relationships evolve as her financial life evolves? What is it that she's looking to be able to accomplish in her relationships and in her life and in the quality of her life as she moves forward? He may have very aggressive plans about wealth building in a, you know, in a dollar number and in his mind about how he thinks about um, financial decision making and risk taking as far as wealth building goes. She may really be looking more at establishing a safety nest for her family, establishing and, um, you know, maybe paying off the mortgage, 
and and having a um, an extra bedroom is is kind of where she wants to be to be able to take care of family and be able to you know make sure that she has a house that accommodates um, family gatherings or um, a a you know a, a a haven and a resort for her to kind of hang out in as she as she gets older and so. The, the, that's the kind of thing that I would say, you know, he will be more aggressive in, in driving goals. And if he can tie her goals to, to more relational things rather than numbers things, um, he may be able to help her see where getting um, ahead of some of those numbers will help her meet some of her relational goals um, in the future. And that, that may be the way to kind of bridge that gap. All right. Okay, I think we've so, uh, gotten the, all the questions answered. Thank you, Nikki. Great. So um, on the heels of that, I want to introduce to you, we're very excited about our new coach network. So um, here we're providing support and becoming more behaviorally smart. So what I just walked through was kind of my points of view about what would happen with Jennifer and Matt as an advisor. I only use the financial behavior report because I know that that's the basic report that everybody's got access to. Um, but through our coach network, we're offering, if you go to the client facilitation tab there, we're offering you as advisors one-on-one -on -one support. So if you have a client meeting coming up and you would really like for me to walk through that kind of debrief or those kind, think about the questions that you would ask, think about the flex that you would need to make as an advisor, think about a couple and how you might want to handle if the if Matt and Jennifer were a couple, how might you handle those that very the 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 differences between them and the differences between them and yourself in that meeting. So we can provide one-on-one -on -one support to you to do that. Um, and we've got a couple of different options there that I'll share with you in a minute. Um, we can also do a facilitated team session. So if you want to do this with a family that you have that's coming in and you want to do a little bit of a, a, an experience with that family so that they can all get a, a little bit of a deeper dive on their behavior and talk about how this works um, as, they're, as they're planning for their financial future as a family. Um, we also... Um, have some training around how to engage clients and how to build this build a process into your practice to allow you to engage with clients and think about the flex and think about which reports you're going to use and how you're going to use them and how you're going to introduce them um, and like i said we can do the the family behavior discovery and that the facilitated team discovery also allows us to work with you as an advisor and the folks in your office so your support staff your partners if you want to do a team session to really understand each other as a working team, we're happy to do that for you. And so you can find us at dnabehavior.com slash dnacoach.network. Um, and so the options that we have for you here, we have lots of modules. So we can do a pre-recorded debrief for you where I will do 30 minutes of a debrief on a client report that you send us so we can walk through that financial behavior report. What questions might I ask? How might I set that meeting up? Um, we can look at that report and, and any others that you want us to look at in that in that 30 minute session. I can pre-record that and send you a recording of that so that you can listen to it again and again. I can do that live session with you so that you can ask me questions real time and we can kind of talk through how you'd want to do that facilitation with your client. If you would like, I can join you with a client or with a client couple and do that debrief with you so that if questions come up around these behaviors, I can be there to help you answer those questions. Um, so those are some options that we have in that 30 minute debrief of those first two options there. Also, if you wanna be a trusted advisor for your clients um, and provide them a resource if they're interested in learning more about their own DNA or building um, some business acumen or building their careers. We also have um, coaching calls that we can do and we've set up either a, a single coaching call, two calls in our one month package, six calls in our three month package or 12 calls in our six month package. Um, and then I talked a little bit about our online team facilitation where we can come and work with your office or your advisory team or with the um, family behavior discovery, 
where, and um, we have Hugh really um, as the lead on this, where we can do a planning meeting with you around what are we trying to get with the family? What are the issues that you've seen with the family? And then a 90 minute discovery with the family where we walk them through their report, walk them through some of the conversations, help facilitate conversation with them, and then do a debrief with you, the advisor after that session so that you can build your plan on how you're gonna continue to work with that family based on what we saw in the meeting, how you might wanna develop a, a plan to continue to work with that family post that session. Um, we can mix and match some of this if you wanna request a custom package, um, there's an option for you to schedule a consult to do that. So all of this is currently available right now on the DNA Coach Network, so we're super excited about that. And then like I said, if you are looking to have more resources to be able to offer your clients when they come in to work with you, we also want to be a trusted um, a resource for you and your clients. So we have several um, programs here to work with individuals, with small business owners, and with business teams around um, conflict and career progression, emotional intelligence, leadership style, influence. We have several business development things where we can come in and work with the whole business, a whole small business, um, or, or a whole business unit, business team, and really do some coaching with the whole organization. And then, um, or at the team development level, kind of more for larger organizations that they're looking for some team development work, we can, we can help with that. So as your clients um, are talking with you about their goals and things that they're looking for, if, if you need a resource to give them to dive deeper into their personality, dive deeper into some of these topics, we would love for you to refer your clients to the DNH Coach Network. And, and again, the same link, um, there's just a different tab here. So I showed you the client facilitation tab earlier, and then there's this personal development, business development, team development tab that have different programs. As you hover over each of these, you'll see a short description of what that program is. And then like all of these programs can be done as a, as a one and done session, as a one month, three month, or six month coaching program uh, for your clients. Another thing that we're super excited about um, is our uh, financial DNA accreditation training. And I apologize that it says BDNA here. I didn't catch that earlier. Um, but we have a new cohort starting August 19th. So with this, you will, um, you will get an in-depth review of our reports and tools. We'll answer your questions and review some case studies. So what happens is it's a hybrid self-study and in-person or in virtual online training. So we're getting a cohort together. You'll do some self-study up front. We will meet as a group. I will do a brief overview of what you studied, answer your questions that, that you come with from the self-study. And then we will do some practice debriefs. We will walk through some real cases that you have. If you want to bring real examples, we can do that. Um, and, and we will walk through debriefing one another and thinking through how this works in your practice. People that are part of this cohort can share best practices from their practice. So um, we're really excited to offer this. And uh, the, our first in-person meeting is August 19th. The program will send you their pre-work by August 12th. Um, so, uh, would love to have you join us and be part of that group. There's lots of opportunity for discussion and networking with one another and getting some real case studies and best practice. So we're super excited to announce that. And I think we've got another poll question for you. All right. Uh, so that'll show up on the screen in just a minute. Um, but that this question is how likely it is that you would refer or use the DNA Coach Network. Um, a, already have, B, very likely, C, I'd like to learn more, D, not very likely, and E, not at all. So this is gonna show up on the screen here. Give me one moment, I'll present it. Okay. And it is on the screen now, should show up. And if it's, I know a couple of people have had some difficulty seeing it, hopefully it's available for everyone. And we've got about 75% of the voting in. We'll just take another five seconds. Uh, 
All right, here we go. And here's the results. <clears throat> so uh, A, we've got 11% that have already taken advantage of the coach network. We've done a little bit of marketing on that, so that's great. B, very likely 44%. C, very like, would like to learn a little bit more. Um, D, not to uh, want to be a little bit more self, uh, self-sufficient. And then E, not at all, there's zero. So that's great. And if anybody does want to learn more, we'll certainly make it available. As I mentioned, we'll send out this presentation along with the link to the coach network so you can explore that. And also that cohort training that Nikki was mentioning. You know, obviously with the world changed with uh, COVID, we've had to move our training, which we've always done in-person training. So we moved it to more of a virtual cohort training. So we're pretty excited. We launched the first one this morning for Business DNA. So we're excited for this August 19th class. If you want to learn more about it, you can contact me, Leon Morales, or Lisa Travis. Both of us can help uh, direct you to the right area. So we appreciate that. And now I'll turn it back over to Nikki. Great. Thanks, Leon. So I do want to um, just open up. So as you can think about what questions do you have for us? Do you have thoughts that you want to share? And if you would, in the chat box, just share what is your biggest takeaway from today or what are your biggest takeaways from today? And I didn't put a slide together for this, but while you're doing that, I just want to mention that we do have a new, um, an easier referral program coming up for you. So coming soon, there will be a link inside the admin system for you to um, click on to get your referral code or referral link. Um, and we'll make an announcement when that comes out, but that will be coming out soon. And what that will do is give you $100 off on your subscription and we'll give your uh, referee $100 off on their first month subscription. So it's our Give 100, Get 100 referral program. So if uh, you have other advisors that you would like to refer to DNA, coming soon you will see a link inside your admin system where you can click on that, get your referral code, and send that along um, to refer others. So. Um, Nikki, we do have a question that came in, actually two uh -huh. of them. One is, um, I think the learning around that is the uh, relating to the one pager to the clients. Mm -hmm. it's, a agree, it's, a, it's a great asset, so um, that's great. And uh, let's see, Coach Network's an excellent addition to the services. Thank you for that. And the comparison report with the client advisor was the best. So that was great as well. So good feedback. Excellent. Excellent. So um, we did get a question mailed to us ahead of the event. So I'm going to cover that. And then if we have any additional questions or comments, we'd love to hear those. Um, but um, so in this crazy COVID time, what if work isn't getting done the same way? Dear DNA, I've been able to get my team back up remotely, but now I can't see them working. And I can't just ask for stuff across the hall or at the next desk. So I'm not sure that they're really contributing. What should I do? So great question. I think a lot of leaders are struggling a little bit with this. And so things to think about that you can do to help ensure that your team is being productive and contributing are to make sure that you're setting clear direction and goals with your teams. Um, in, this, in this virtual time and space, um, communicating more than you think is necessary is really important. Often because you've generated an idea or things are easier for you or, or you know, as a leader of a practice or an advisor, things that may seem like no duh, no brainer things to you um, may need to be repeated to people that are, you're working with so that they really make sure that they're clear. A lot of times also having people repeat back to you what actions are you gonna take as a result of what we just said or what other questions do you have can really help you understand if your messages are being understood by others. Um, reaching out to team members that you think are falling behind. So if you are, since you can't see them working, if you have a, a sense that somebody is really falling behind, reaching out to them and seeing how you can help set reasonable uh, goals for them, agreeing on accountability and seeing what you can do to help uh, remind them of those accountabilities and, and um, help build 
uh, build in check-ins to make sure that you're seeing progress because it sounds like you know potentially in this situation you're just not seeing enough progress so how can you agree to build some check-ins so that you're seeing progress along the way um, and then reflecting a little bit on where do you have room to grow some trust do you actually have evidence that they're not working or is this a feeling of loss of control for you um, a lot of times we just um, a lot of leaders have assumed that you know, when they can see people at their desk that they're that they're working and they understand that they're there and being productive, out of sight becomes a little bit scarier for, I don't know if you're taking care of your kids or if you're actually doing the work that I've asked you to do. So really uh, think about how, what kind of trust level do you already have with this employee? Is there something that you can do to grow that trust? And are you acting out of fear? Are you um, maybe in a stress response? Do you have evidence that they're really not working? And how can you find out if what you fear that your people aren't working on is true? Is there, are there ways that you can check in? Are there ways that you can look for solid evidence that, that people are falling behind and then figure out a plan for how you can support those people? So those are some of the things that I would say that you could look at doing if you, you know, are feeling this loss of control with people really being remote and not being able to be all together. Um, during this during this you know season of of remote working for most of us is is kind of new so those are just some things that you can think about um, but we really appreciate your time with us today um, just a reminder that Hugh's book um, was released early this year and is still out and available on Amazon got some really great information in it um, and dives deep into all of these behavioral traits and, and really is a great reference as you're thinking through how you're gonna do debriefs on these reports, thinking through how you might wanna ask questions of your client. And then Leon, I will give it back to you. All right, thank you, Nikki. We really appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, this was an important session just to introduce the coach network, the uh, cohort training, the financial DNA court cohort training. As we always say, we're available. If you have a question, we try to make ourselves available. Even if you go to one of the websites and you see the live chat button come up, if you need a call back from one of us, you know, we'll make sure that you get a call back. We really are here to support you. It's been a very different experience for us as a team in the last, you know, four months. And as Nikki mentioned, that, that last, you know, ask DNA is probably one thing that we've all had to learn how to, to cope with as well. And, you know, some using some of the behavior information that Nikki reviewed today can be pretty imperative to having successful outcomes with your people and for your clients as well, because they're probably searching through the same things. So we appreciate it. You will get a copy of this recording along with uh, the presentation from Lisa Travis later, uh, probably tomorrow morning. And there is a short survey that'll come out uh, probably in about 20 minutes. If you would take the time to just answer you know, your thoughts, because it really helps us build our next program for the next quarter. With that, Nikki and I really appreciate all your help and uh, look forward to seeing you on a future webinar call. Thank you.